after hearing all the predecessors, uh, what I see, I think what we all see, is that um, you know, the free market allows multiple and actually the most ways of access. And this is where the government is just completely screwed up. You know, you got three flavors, take it or leave it. It's nonsense. It's the most inefficient way to do things. We all have different needs, and even the physicians have different needs and different desires. I guess from looking at my practice, I, maybe I'm a little bit more of a businessman, but I didn't intend to be that. I just kind of keep going every day and figuring out how to make things better and try to, try to get along with everybody and all that stuff. I also can tell from my eight points of objectives that I was going to try to get, I can't do that. I speak too, I, I'm too talkative. So anyway, uh, the first slide was to show you that I uh, have written extensively on my blog site about um, health care, and I argued the point why in the next five years, I believe, Medicare is insolvent. And it's time for the citizens and the doctors to figure out how to move forward, because the, the smoke signals from on high are very clear. They don't want to pay for anything. They're making you go get your diabetic supplies at retail, uh, it's, it's become too cumbersome to do anything. No one wants to participate. I don't want to participate anymore. I know all other doctors are pretty sick of it. I'm, I'm going to be talking about third-party free practice in my transition. I've had a lot of uh, different practice styles. I came in joining a partnership. Then they sold within six months of my joining to a hospital system. Uh, actually, our current governor, Rick Scott, was my boss because he owned the hospital system. He was, the, I guess, the CEO of the hospital system that employed me. So I just wanted to talk about, well, how's, you know, how does the system work now? You know, what's the market? You got a patient, you got insurance, you got a physician. That seems to be the market. Here's the patient. It's now mandated. By law, you must surrender a large amount of money to an insurer. By law, mandated. Craziness. All right, insurer, we get to siphon off part of the money for the exchange that was going to occur regardless. Government, now mandated. Let's take our piece. Look at the tax train here. I mean, tell me why they're interested. It's very obvious. And then finally, the doctor gets to finally service the patient. This is not efficient. That's not efficient economics. So, back up. The hospital arranged or a system actually was working well, except they got nervous. The government decided to accuse them of Medicare fraud. So then they decided they didn't want doctors anymore. So they kicked us out. And so we went back, my core guys and I, and we uh, ended up back in private practice in 1998. It took me two years, um, but I convinced them we need to eschew private insurance. Now, Medicare at the time was also a problem, but, and, and let me back up again, in 97, the healthcare law made price fixing the law also. And that is when things really started to go downhill. The quality of medicine, as far as I can tell, and I started practicing in 93, it peaked in 1998. And it almost correlates directly with when price fixing of our services began to be the reality and the law of the land. So what happened was the, the, you could see the insurance companies quickly dropping their reimbursement down to that floor. They figured, hey, they're working for Medicare. That's all we're paying. So here we are. We keep going along. And they're jerking our chain. And we just keep going along. Uh, and so I finally convinced my partners, hey, look, you can see the money drop in here, but these guys don't let us do any ancillary services. Everything we want to do requires multiple calls. I said, our overhead is just even higher than with Medicare. So obviously, they're the first people that would be asked to leave. And so we did that. Bottom line, it didn't hurt us. We did uh, quickly after that start posting our cash prices. And that, I've been doing that pretty much ever since, at least officially, I would say 2005. I've been doing that on my website forever. Um, I just feel that's the way you, a market should work. This slide, I think, is very, very frightening. And this comes from my son. He works for J.P. Morgan. Uh, so he, he loaned me this slide out of an analysis they did for the insurance industry. The insurance industry is looking at the market right now, and you know these mergers are happening, right? So apparently, I don't know which one, but somebody wanted them to look at all this. So here's what's happened to us doctors. We're, we're, we just crossed over and at, pretty much with Obamacare. We went to 50-50. And now we're down here at less than 20% of us in private practice. That is astounding. I like this slide, too, because I, I wanted to talk briefly about some forces that just preceded Obamacare that were already causing this, this, this transition. One was the price fixing in 97. Next came more price fixing. Around 2000, and, uh, I think around 2005 or 6, is when the CMS decided to cut radiology and cardiology services 
50% in a two-year sequence. And there you saw a massive efflux of physicians because they basically bought all this infrastructure based on a pro forma and a price that was, quote, market-based because it was the government's price. And then the government decided to change the price. And now all of a sudden they're, they've got all this debt. They don't have any, they don't have, they'll never make the payments. And so they had to sell out. And they did. And that's manifested in that graph. And uh, the other thing is the hospitalist movement. The hospitalist movement has created, uh, the, the hospitals are buying all of our trained physicians at a premium. And private practice doctors under especially these current payment schemes cannot compete. You cannot give a, a walking out of residency resident a $300,000 salary in a private practice. It's impossible to do, at least if you continue to be inside these constraints. So I just wanted to show that. And then of course, now the ACO model, they're gonna to try to take this down to zero. So the ideal model, it's a simple thing. It's called the free market. A patient needs a service, a doctor's there and wants to provide it for them. Pretty simple. Let's put the money where it belongs. Why deploy your capital over into a holding company when all you want, all you want is a service? So 2011, I created the Inpatient Advocate Service. Uh, this uh, is a little story. The hospitalist movement got me out of, and I'm, a, I'm an internist. I used to round in the ICU in the morning, then go to the office and take care of my patients and come back. I couldn't afford to do it anymore, right? And uh, with that in mind, uh, I started struggling with this concept. How could I get back there? And how could I do it legally? And the reality is in Fort Myers, Florida, the majority of my clients are Medicare. So it's a real problem. Do I, you know, how, how do I do this and stay in business? Because in my town, I think it really is financial suicide to, uh, to opt out of Medicare completely, at least especially in 2011. I think, the, I think the dynamics are changing now. Um, so basically, I came up with this concept, the inpatient hospital service. It is a private direct contract. No conflict of interest because the patient is paying me. Now, what do I do? I do not interfere with the model. I work with the model. This, by the way, model can be replicated in any community that has a hospitalist uh, run hospital program because this is a direct contract with your patient. It's not a violation of Medicare because it is not a coded service. And it is a transition in and out of the hospital. I don't charge, I don't charge any fees when I go there to the, to the system. It's already been paid for. And it's done two ways, a premier capitated payment once a year or a, slow, a, a smaller premium annually, a retainer annually with an hourly fee for my concierge time. So I give personal visits 24 seven. So they got, got to have my phone number if they're gonna tell me they're in the hospital in the middle of the night. That's fine, I wanna know. Um, it's interesting, this relationship, however, creates a great incentive for me to be even more available in the office because if I can circumvent the hospital, that's one less trip I gotta take in town, right? So actually, it works quite well in that regard. So uh, I just wanted, and that's where my disclosure about Cypress Medical, that I created a second company because I wanted to see it outside of my other practice. 2015, big transition. 2014, I was with my partners. I've been with them since 1993 in one shape, form, or another but I left them because in 2014, I saw that I was not gonna be able to sustain the overhead of the practice. I kept myself as the always only physician available to my patients. I had no extenders. I didn't like that model, I didn't care for it, and I refused to do it and it eventually got to me. I couldn't afford it. Then came ICD-10 and there was gonna be a six figure investment on some more stuff. And I was like, this is not gonna work for me, I gotta bail. So we left on good terms. In fact, I'm still in the same building because we co-own that building. And uh, so I went on my own. Now, I want to get to uh, the mid-year. This is where the transition really accelerates. And uh, by the way, I think this is the path that's going to happen to a lot of us going forward. Um, I had already changed my practice. I tried to shore up my overhead. I, I got a new EHR system, went cloud-based, slashed lots and lots of costs. Uh, don't pay for labs. I got rid of certain services, so now my overhead went down some more. But and I but I had to keep my clinical staff. It's just as an internist, there's a lot. I, my patients average six to seven medical illnesses. I need team help. I got to have people helping me with phone calls and, and and coordination of care and that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, so I have to have my my two clinical staff, a receptionist, and I do presently have a full time manager, and she's right back there. That's my lovely wife, Margaret, and. Uh, that seems to be a theme here. If you're going to go on your own, you better bring your wife. Uh, so, 
at the end of the day, I realized I can't make it. So I had my fee for service for my cash based business, my third party free business. That fee was fine. And if I could get that fee, I'd be fine. But I can't get that fee for my Medicare clients. And so I do treat all my patients the same. All of them get the same service all the time, regardless of their pay, ability to pay or otherwise. But the problem was, I was being forced on a fee schedule that I just couldn't make the system run on. So I realized, okay, I did a count. I had 21 things I do every day and credentials that I have that aren't required for Medicare. And I decided I've got to get paid. So I made a call on my clients and I said, long-term relationships. And I just explained it to them. I said, this is where I am. I'm either leaving and you're without me or I'm staying and I require that you become a member of my practice. And for that, I'm going to give you my inpatient advocate service as part of my concierge program. I didn't like concierge either. That's why I called it the inpatient advocate service. I kept saying, it's not concierge medicine. It's an actual different service. But guess what? The market doesn't understand that. And that's a bit of a challenge for DPC, by the way. The market gets concierge. They say, oh, I get it. You're actually asking for money. The other things they don't get. So the business model, at the end of a year, this I just did this stuff. I went from 85% Medicare to 30% uh, cash-based, 70% Medicare. The money comes from membership revenue and fee-for-service. 11% of my cash patients pay me electively for the inpatient advocate service. They pay, remember, a fee-for-service that's market-priced. It's my fee. And they don't argue with me about it. That's what they pay, and they pay at the door and all that stuff like we've already heard. The Medicare patients, 92% of them are now, I say, in, uh, re membership revenue, including the inpatient advocate service. 8% of them are not because that's my charity. I know those people, and I'm not going to abandon them, and I know they can't pay me, so they're staying in the practice. And then the rest comes from office visits for fee-for-service and other services I provide, and then finally office visits. So I'm showing you, you know, real numbers, so to speak. So the breakdown of revenue at the end of this last year, back up slightly. I had the worst salary ever, except for the first year when I was hired at $86,000 for my first year of employment in 2014. I owed my practice money, despite on historical levels, drawing an actual conservative salary. I knew that it wasn't going to be bad, but I didn't know it was going to be as bad as it was. So I can't tell everybody, I timed this perfectly. <laughs> All right, now, so <clears throat> now here we are. 58% of my revenues are coming from office visit fee for service services. 33% are coming from my membership, which basically provides the experience and the quality that I provide to my patients. That does include not extra visit time, proper visit time. And everybody gets that, everybody, regardless. And finally, 9% uh, of my revenue do come from ancillary services. I mentioned again in my disclosure, I have a couple of products that I really endorse. I think they're great. And I use them myself, that kind of stuff. And I'm getting into remote monitoring because guess what, folks? The virtual office is where it's going to be. By the way, don't buy medical real estate. That's a bad decision right now because people are going to get more and more mobile and we need to be part of it. Um, facts and figures. Here I am about to show you my underwear. <laughs> 621 active patients pre-transition. Now, I define that by a unique client seen in the last 12 months. If I went 18 months out, it's probably 720, 760, something like that, which might explain one of the other things you're going to see in a moment. Uh, 506, so I lost patients with the transition, obviously. You'd expect that. But actually, it wasn't as bad. I think my wife told me there was no way I was going to keep 250 people, so I proved her wrong. Actually, people do value us. I added 74 new clients during that year. By the way, the year before, because I was not taking new Medicare patients unless they joined my membership, I probably averaged, I probably made 10 new clients the whole year, to be honest with you. So basically, the Medicare clients, like everybody, they'll keep taking from you as long as you let them. But when you call them on it, they're going to come up with a reality check and they're going to stay with you if you're providing them a good quality service. I lost an estimate 190 with the membership. That's a little... I think because it's probably went out, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to separate that 18 month part of my chart that was already there, so to speak. So that's why if you do the math, it doesn't quite add up. And then I think I'm on track easily to get 90 new clients this year. Significant financial improvement.
In 2014, I generated $857,000, but my costs were almost all of it. So many of the things I billed for were kind of pass-throughs. Drugs, Medicare gives you 3%, right? 3%. So, you know, so $1,200 for reclass, I get $1,216. Thank you very much. Out the door it goes. So I had a 14% quote profit margin. What that I mean is that's my take-home pay as a private business owner. This time around, revenues went up. I had less patience, as you saw, and my profit margin went to 39%. So we want to do that. <laughs> I'm very happy. Now, I wanted to go finally with macro. I feel like that's like telegraphing us even more, and it just adds to what I wrote in the blog. Medicare is done. It's toast. And so I just think it's, I think if there's anything here to say to everybody, you can't keep coming to this meeting and not do something. It is time to move. And I made my move, and I think it's going to have to continue. It guarantees no increased pay net because it's 2.5% over five years. But remember, we've been clawed back for four years, 2% on the, on the Health Sharing Act. It's pitting doctors against doctors, which is the typical gain-sharing model. And that's just gonna, you know, they get us fighting with each other, it's great, it's just great. They'll just keep putting more stuff on us while we're arguing with each other. Uh, it, it, so we're left with a Hobson's choice. Get part of this vertical ACO thing, which is quite frankly an HMO model that's for hospitals, all right? That's what that is. If you like that, if you think you're the advocate for your patient in that environment, good luck, all right? I'm going to have a lot of enemies, by the way, because in my town, it's, it's not good. Anyway, finally, nurture these models that we just supported, or just uh, explained to you. I'm sorry I tried to run a lot of information there in a short period of time. And um, that's it.